latest story, and it's actually a year-long series that started there the beginning of January and will take us all the way through the end of December. Every week we're looking at a Bible short story that lends itself to the greatest story, right? Uh, well, this morning we're not going to do that. We're going to break away from that sermon series. It'll be the only Sunday this year that I do that. But I want to take some time this morning to break away from that series to really tell you the greatest story. The greatest story of all. Of why we can be here this morning and we can celebrate together. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, please go with me to the 22nd chapter of Luke. The 22nd chapter of Luke. That's where we're going to start. We'll bounce around a bit and go to some different places. Uh, but we're going to start there in Luke chapter 22 with verse 40 here in just a few minutes. Again, keep those communion cups and wafers handy. We'll leave those here in just a little bit. I titled today's sermon, Come and See, because when we get to the end, you'll see how that plays in according to Matthew chapter 28, verse 6. But today I want to preach a little bit on the story of the shedding of Jesus' blood. The story of the shedding of Jesus' blood in the sermon I've titled, Come and See. And this particular story, of course, deals with how Jesus shed his blood for your sins and for my sins. And it is the story of how God miraculously raised him from the dead. That's why we're here this morning celebrating. That's why we gather as a body of believers each Sunday morning uh, and, and think about the fact that we serve a resurrected and risen Savior. I said last week that there are many churches and Christians who do not like to mention or talk about sin. Remember me saying that last week? Well, there are just as many that do not like to talk about or mention blood, especially with the blood of Christ. Uh, but this morning, I want to take you on a journey uh, of the last 24 hours of Jesus' earthly life before he's, he's, he's murdered and before he's buried and before he's resurrected. And I want to show you the different places that he spent those last 24 hours and the places and how he shed his blood for us. Why? Why is that important for us on Easter Sunday morning, 2022? Because it was the Apostle Paul who said that it was in the blood of Christ we find redemption. The reason that we are redeemed and able to be saved is because of the precious blood that Jesus Christ shed upon Mount Calvary. And so it's important for us to, to talk about those things and to remember that precious blood and, and to sing about it. And our choir is saying, written in red, and it's talking about how our salvation was written in the blood of Christ. And so when we come to this place on this day, it's important to remember the blood that Jesus shed. Why did God require the shedding of blood for the remission of sin? Because He is God. And it was His prerogative to do so. He didn't need your permission and He didn't need mine. He required blood from the very beginning and that settled it. Why is it important for us as believers uh, and as a church body to remember the blood that Jesus shed upon Calvary. Why is it important for us to preach on it and to talk about it often? Well, the Apostle John said that if we walk in the light as he is in the light and then we have fellowship with one another, that it is the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, who cleanses us from all sin. So if we are to be cleansed from our sin, then it is because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for. And so, yes, we appreciate the day. We value the day, the, the day that he was risen. But he had to shed all of his blood first. Join me in a moment of prayer as we prepare to, to dive into God's word today. Father in heaven, as we gather here on this very important day, Lord, we remember the blood that was shed for the remission of sin. We will walk through that experience today and understand and look forward to the fact that you are indeed risen. Lord, my hope now in the quietness of the moment is that you will speak to all hearts, that your Holy Spirit will move upon those in attendance today, both here and in the fellowship hall, that you will lead and guide and help us, God, to draw ever closer to you, to remember the reason that we can celebrate in the first place, because we serve a resurrected and risen Savior. 
Thank you for that precious blood, God, which cleansed us from all our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're take you this morning to the different spots at which Jesus shed his blood. The first spot I would take you to would be the, the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Number one, the, gar the shedding of Jesus' blood began in the Garden of Gethsemane. It started there in the Garden. It's late Thursday night. The, the Last Supper has already happened. And now Jesus deliberately makes his way to the Garden of Gethsemane where he will pray and spend a few hours and prepare for his coming suffering. Notice what happens as we begin reading there from Luke 22, starting in verse 40. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Let's pause there just for a minute and think about the Garden of Gethsemane. You have to remember that it was in the Garden of Eden that God began life several thousand years earlier. So it was there in that Garden of Eden that life began with Adam. And now it is here in this garden several thousand years later uh, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, the second Adam, and he's going to begin the process of ending his life. God began it with Adam there in the Garden of Eden, and now Jesus is preparing for his life to end here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Did you know that it was there in the Garden of Gethsemane where they would often bring the olives to what? To squeeze and press them so that they could get what? Oil. And it was under that extreme pressure that they would squeeze those olives and that oil would run forth and they would capture that oil. And here it is now that Jesus, under the same extreme kind of pressure, the anxiety of the ordeal to come, he perfectly well knows what's about to happen. And that pressure squeezing down on him, so much so that the, the anxiety and the stress of it causes the little capillaries in the brow to burst. And as he's there that evening and that night and he's praying, then that sweat mixes with those bursted capillaries and he literally sweats drops of blood. We've all experienced stress at some point in our lives, haven't we? I bet none of us have ever sweat drops of blood. But there's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the pressure on him squeezing like nothing before. And he begins shedding his blood there for the remission of sin. Even before he's ever arrested, before the beatings ever begin to take place, there he sweats drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I know for a fact that as he's there in the garden, he must have thought back to that dreadful day when Adam sinned in the garden. And now the responsibility of overcoming that sin rests squarely upon the shoulders of Jesus. And don't forget that in the garden of Eden, Adam hid after his sin. Yet now in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus boldly presents himself as the Savior of all mankind. What Adam couldn't do, Jesus did perfectly. So even before the cruelty of the cross ever starts, before it ever gets going, Jesus is already shedding blood for the remission of our sin. After spending most of the night there in the garden, Jesus is then arrested by the Roman soldiers and he's turned over to the religious leaders of his day. By now, it's early Friday morning, perhaps sometimes or sometime around sunrise. Number two, the shedding of Jesus' blood continued in the back halls of Pilate's home. The shedding of Jesus' blood continued in the back halls of Pilate's home. Jesus is about to go and stand trial before Pontius Pilate, who was, of course, the governor at this time. Once the chief priest, though, in the Sanhedrin, about 70 get a hold of Jesus, they take turns beating on him. They're angry at him. Who is this man that's claiming to be the Messiah? And so there, 
the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, they take turns. And they punch him, and they slap him, and they push him down, and they blindfold him and tell him, prophesy, tell us who it is that hits you. They were beating God, they were beating the creator of the world. No doubt Jesus knew exactly who it was that was punching them. Then the Roman guards took him, and they beat on him a little bit. It was sport for them, though. They found joy in it. It was part of their job descriptions. And so while he waited there in the back halls of Pilate's palace, Scripture teaches us that he was beaten and that he was mocked and that he was teased. Not only that, and a lot of people miss this, but they literally ripped the beard from his face. That was prophesied thousands of years earlier in Isaiah 56. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to the Snyders and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. It's likely that Jesus had never shaved. It was common for Jewish men during that time to never shave their face. My face is tough and my neck is tough. I've been shaving my whole life. A razor had never hit his. His face was soft and tender. So they get him back there and in walks an old mean Roman guard and he gets a handful of beard and he just rips it from his face. So not only is he, his eyes, are they now swollen from the beatings and possibly had a, a nose that was bleeding and lips that had been punctured and of course his brow had been sweating already but now he's sweating from where his beard used to be as they literally ripped the hair off of his face. And the blood ran forth, church, for your sins and for mine. From there, Jesus is sent to Herod, sent back to Herod and then back to Pilate. They bounce him around a little bit, not knowing exactly what to do. You know the story. Eventually, Pontius Pilate agrees to the crucifixion. But before that can happen, Jesus has to be scourged. The third place I would have you to notice at which Jesus shed his blood was number three. Jesus shed his blood at the whipping post. Jesus shed his blood at the whipping post. Some think that Pilate, hoping that the severe whipping of Jesus might satisfy the angry Jews, decides to have him scourged. In the 19th chapter of John, verse 1, it says, Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. The scourging at the whipping post, y'all, was horrific. I could talk to you about it for the next three hours and I would not do it justice. It was a terrible process. Jesus is first stripped of his clothes. Part of the shame of the scourging was the shame of being nude and his hands are tied high above his head so that his legs and his buttocks and his back is completely bare, completely exposed. And then out walks Another old Roman soldier, and he's holding something called a flagellum. It's like a whip. He'll use it to perform the beating. Don't know exactly how long that whip is. I know that it resembled a whip. The handle was wrapped in leather, and that was so that the man doing the beating could hold it and hold it well because blood would inevitably splatter all over it. And within this particular whip, it's thought that it had nine to ten long leather straps and embedded in those leather straps were bone fragments and pieces of glass and rock. Anything else that can bruise and tear and rip flesh. At the end of those leather straps, they embedded something called a hawk bill. Long and sharp. And its sole purpose, because it was curved, was it would sink into the skin. And then the man doing the beating would leave it there just for a second. And then he would rip it away so that the skin became like ribbons. Jewish law said you couldn't take more than 40 lashes. Some think Jesus took 39, but I would remind you that it aren't, it's not the Jews that are whipping him, it's the Romans. Romans didn't have to follow Jewish law. He took at least 39 strikes with that thing, but he probably took many more. And there he stands, our Savior, 
perfection getting the life literally beat out of him. The Roman soldiers would often try to beat a man to death at the whipping post to prevent from having to actually crucify him. And so there, one after another, these 39 lashes at least happened. The Romans were brutal. This was sport to them. They often take turns to see who could hit the prisoner the hardest. Certainly if from exhaustion and loss of blood, sometimes the prisoners would fall. And they would even bring Roman soldiers in to prop them up and hold them up while the beating continued. And this went on and on and on as they tried to beat Jesus to death. It reminds me of what Isaiah chapter 53 says. Remember what it says? That he was brought as a lamb to the wood, to the slaughter. And friend, a slaughter it was. And so he's there at the whipping post. He's shedding blood from his nose and his mouth and his eyes. And now his back. They said that his skin probably literally hung like ribbons. And there he is shedding the blood for the remission of our sins. It's the blood sacrifice that God required so that we might be saved. From the whipping post, he is led back to Herod's complex while they prepare the crucifixion site. Go in your Bible to Mark 15. I wasn't going to have you go there, but I want you to look at it. Go back to, go forward to Mark 15. Because as we get to point four here where Jesus is shedding his blood in Herod's hall, I want you to notice verses 16 through 20. Remember, he's been shedding blood from his brow. He's been beaten, kicked, punched, slapped, mocked, teased. He's been beaten now with the flagellum. He's taken back to Herod's hall. And look at verse 16. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple... And they plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him and bowing their knees, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. I want you to pay particular attention to the thorns that were used there, which were hammered into the scalp of our Lord. It's believed that the thorns used are not like the thorns we may have in our own yards, but these special kind of thorns were likely an inch or so long. They resembled needles. A long branch was cut from a nearby shrub, and there a Roman guard twisted it and fashioned it into a crown, and they literally plated it on the head of Christ. They think that they took their palms and pressed it down onto his scalp, and then likely another Roman soldier came in with a mallet and hammered those thorns into his scalp. There are many theologians that think once this was done, you could have walked up to Christ, grabbed the hair of his head, and literally removed his scalp. And there in the back halls of Herod, he continues to shed his blood for our sins. Again, like a lamb led to the slaughter, where there now they have scalped Jesus Christ. It was brutal. It was horrible. It was, it was worse than what we can possibly describe or imagine here today. But it happened. It was the shedding of blood so that we might have salvation all part of God's plan for redemption. And isn't it interesting that when Adam and Eve sinned, part of the curse that they received from God was that the ground would be cursed. It says that in pain you shall eat of it, thorns and thistles shall come forth. And the Romans unknowingly took an object of the curse and made it into a crown for the one who would deliver us from that curse. Only God could do that. From Herod's hall, 
He's then led to Golgotha. <coughs> Jesus shed his blood on the road to Golgotha, number five. After they had spit on him and mocked him and laughed at him and beat him and now planted a crown of thorns upon his brow, they make their way to this place of the skull, a place called Golgotha. Despite all that he had been through, it was required that he carry his cross. I'm not interested in debating with you if he carried the entire cross or just the cross beam. It doesn't matter to me. He carried his cross. The man has been beaten within an inch of his life. He is continuing to be whipped and punched and pushed all the way down the Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering. And let me stop right here for a minute. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Jesus fell. If anyone's ever told you that, it's a lie. He did not fall. It does not say he fell. He was not carrying the cross hard enough and fast enough for the Roman soldiers so they compelled one Simon of Cyrene to carry it for him. But let me ask you a question. If you had been beaten to within an inch of your life, how fast and hard would you carry the cross? Jesus was not a weak man. There was nothing puny about him. I believe that Jesus was a man's man. He was a carpenter. He was lean. He walked everywhere he went by foot. He just simply wasn't going hard enough and fast enough for the Roman soldiers. Number six, I'd have you to see that Jesus shed his blood on the cross. Jesus shed his blood on the cross. Many folks think that it wasn't until he got on the cross that he began to shed his blood. That's simply not true. In fact, some believe that most of his blood was gone before he ever got there. But now they get him to Golgotha and they have to secure him to the cross. This was done by nailing the body to the tree. They nailed, put a nail between in the hands and in the feet. The first thing they would do is they would lay the cross down flat on the ground. They would have the person being crucified laid on it on his back. They tie a rope to each arm. One Roman guard would get on that side, one Roman guard would get on that side, and they would pull those arms until the shoulder was dislocated. Then they take a spike and they put it somewhere right along in here, and they drive it right on through the hands. Then they take the feet, place them one on top of the other and drive another seven, eight, nine-inch spike in through both of those feet, securing him to the cross. Once that was done, they would lift the cross, flip it over, and slam it down, oftentimes suffocating and burying the person in the sand and the dirt and the rocks. Why? They had to bend the nails back so they could not come loose. Once that was done, they would stand the cross up, and like my grandfather used to say, they would find that hole that they were going to stick it in and the hole would be full of blood before the cross ever hit the bottom and it would hit with a thud. And there he hung. <clears throat> and down to a cross. Can you... Can you possibly imagine the intense agony the unrelenting pain that was surging through his body as he is nailed there where you and I should have been nailed. This man is perfect. He's done nothing at all to deserve to be there. You and I have done everything to deserve to be there. Yet he says, no, let me. And there he hangs. Friend, me and you, because of our sins, we are as guilty as the Roman soldier standing there with the hammer in his hand. It was you and I that put him there. It was our sinfulness. It was our wrongdoing. It was our turning our back on God Almighty. We put him there. You and I. It was our sin that caused him to be scourged. Our sin that caused the thorns to be beat into his head. It was our sin that caused the beard to be ripped from his face. It was our sin that sent him there that day. Romans 3.10 As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. 
You may be sitting there this morning thinking, I had nothing at all to do with it. That's a lie. Yes, you did. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. Everyone, everyone in the room, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of our sin was paid in the death of Jesus Christ. It's all on us. One author said it this way. Unless you see yourself standing there with the shrieking crowd full of hostility and hatred for the holy and innocent Lamb of God, you don't really understand the nature and the depth of your sin or the necessity of the cross. John R. W. Stott said, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. When they finally get him on the cross, he stays there a couple of hours. There are seven different sayings that's for a different sermon and a different day, but there are three that I would remind you of. Mark chapter 15, verse 34, records one of those sayings. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Around 3 o'clock that afternoon, Jesus being in complete torment, he lifts his head toward heaven, no doubt to get reassurance from God the Father, no doubt to be encouraged and strengthened. But when he lifts his head toward heaven, God is not there. You see, friend, when Jesus was hanging upon that cross, and he became sin. When he became our sin, God could have no part of sin. So it was around that time that God marches 72,000 angels to the back halls of heaven and waits until the crucifixion is completed. We think about all of the things that Jesus experienced the beard being ripped from his face, the mocking, the spitting, the beating uh, when he was scourged, the nails that had been hammered into his hands and into his feet, the thud of the cross as it dropped into the earth. We think of all the aspects, but the one which broke Jesus' heart the most was when he realized that he was alone upon the cross. That he was there by himself taking on the punishment for our sins. All by himself there to bear the sins of the whole world. And friend, thank God he did because let me tell you something. If he had looked toward heaven and just given God any inclination that he had had enough, God would have unleashed 72,000 angels upon this earth and no one would have survived. Amen. One angel in the book of Kings killed 185,000 people. What do you think 72,000 angels would have done? <clears throat> But he didn't. He just kept taking that punishment for me and for you. It wasn't long after that that God realized. It wasn't long after that he realized that God wasn't wasn't there, and he exclaimed, "It is finished." Then, just a few minutes later, he said, "Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit." Get your wafer ready. Jesus is there on the cross. He has just given up the ghost. He's dead. But less than 24 hours earlier, he was there at the Last Supper of all of the disciples. And he was trying to explain to them, though they couldn't quite rationalize or understand, he was trying to explain to them what was going to happen. And one of the things that it says is that as they were there eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your body that was placed upon the cross. Thank you for your body that was broken for my sin and for my family's sin. 
and for the sin of every person in the room today. Thank you, God, for your body that you were willing to have brutally tortured and, and murdered and executed just so that we could have salvation. Thank you, Lord, for this bread and what it represents, what it means to us. Help us, God, to be ever mindful of your great sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. And he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. The Bible also says that he took the cup and he gave thanks. Father, thank you for this cup. Thank you for your precious blood and, and what this cup represents. For reminding us through this opportunity that it was because of the shedding of your blood that we could experience salvation, that we could be saved from our sins. Help us, Lord, as we drink of this cup now to remember the blood that was shed for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let us drink together in remembrance of Christ's blood. Now, go in your Bible back to Matthew chapter 28. When you get there, drop down to verse 6. This is by no means the end of the sermon. The ham can wait. Not by a long shot is this the end. To leave Jesus on the cross would just be plain wrong, wouldn't it? Amen. Why? Because in poor but very plain English, Jesus ain't on no cross. You can see all of the paintings and you can see all of the little crucifixes and all of those things that you want to see that depict Jesus being nailed to a cross. They are all a lie. Every single one of them. Why? Because he's not on a cross. After he dies, they take him down and they put his body in a tomb, in an old borrowed tomb. And they get him wrapped up and, and anointed and all of those different practices and customs that they went through when they buried somebody and, and the Roman guards, they, they roll a rock in front of it, they seal it up right, they, they got it all ready and it's all, all sealed up they, they, they are preventing people from getting in they never thought about somebody getting out and sort of in my mind's eye I can see again another illustration from my grandfather there on that first day the imps of hell they gather around that tomb and they are celebrating. I believe Satan himself was there. They have defeated God. They have killed God. They gather around that tomb and they celebrate. And they are so joyful. And they are so happy. And Friday comes and Friday night comes and Saturday is more of the same. Nothing's happening. They are watching. The imps of hell are watching the people that come to the tomb and they are mourning. They are sad. And those imps of hell are so excited and so happy because they've defeated God. I believe that went on for the rest of Saturday night and into Sunday morning. But then all of a sudden, one of those little imps of hell hears something. walks up to Satan and he says, Sir, something's gone wrong in that tomb. Because early on that Sunday morning, friend, all of the power and might from heaven hit that tomb and Jesus Christ, God's perfect and holy Son, stood up, brushed himself off and walked out alive forevermore. Amen. He is risen. Pilate could not kill him. The grave was unable to hold him. Death 
cannot control him. And Jesus Christ walks out resurrected, alive forevermore, and will never again experience death of any kind. Now you and I will die physically. These bodies will wear out and we will die. But whenever you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you will never die. You will live on forever. That's Satan's greatest promise is that death solves it all. It's like John told me in Sunday school. Satan says death solves it all. Jesus says, no, no, not in my book. Because we serve a risen and resurrected Savior, we call upon Him for the remission of our sins and we too get to live forever with Him in glory and in paradise. Why would anybody in their right mind turn that down? Why would anybody in their right mind say no to that precious sacrifice? You say, brother, what if it's all a big hoax? What if there's no God, there's no Christ, the Bible is fiction? Listen, I would a whole lot rather live my life hoping and believing that there is and that it's true and die and go to heaven than to, to take a chance that it's not true and die and go to hell. Pilate couldn't kill him, Satan couldn't defeat him, and the grave could not hold him. Matthew According to today's sermon title in his book, chapter 28, verse 6, says he is not here for he is risen. I love what it says next. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Interestingly enough, it's hard for you to see in your Bible, but in the original Hebrew, when Matthew wrote this verse, where it says, where he wrote, see where the Lord lay, it was written in past tense. In other words, he says, look where the Lord was at one time laying, but is no longer here. Because the tomb is empty. Listen, all of that happened for your sins and for mine. Every aspect, every, every piece of the torture and the crucifixion and the resurrection, it all happened for, for, our, for the remission of our sins. And I've said it before in this church, and I'll continue to say it until God takes me home. If you had been the only person who ever committed just one sin, this story would still have existed. He died for you. He rose for you. That's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. And listen to me, and I say this with all the love I have, if you refuse the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you and you die and you end up in hell, you deserve every bit that hell has and then some. Because God made a way for you to be saved. He made a way for you to have salvation. He made a way for your sins to be forgiven. And that way, that truth, that life, His name is Jesus Christ. And listen to me, He's risen. Everybody in this room is in one of three categories. Everybody. You are either here today and today is a celebration. Right? Because you are a believer and you are celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again and is coming again and you are saved and you love God and you love Jesus and you are sold out for Him and today is a celebration. Amen? Amen. There are some people in that category. There are some people in another category, I'd call it, there's a celebration category, I'd call it the confirmation category. In the confirmation category, you may have been saved at some point. Because Grandpa took you to Bible school. You, it may have happened, but you aren't quite sure. Let me tell you something. If you aren't sure that you're saved, pretend like you're not. Pretend like you're not, and let's get saved today. Let's get saved today. Don't leave the doors after hearing the message of the crucifixion and the resurrection still not wondering, am I saved? Yes or no? I'm not sure. I went when I was a kid and this thing's happened and lately my life isn't what it's supposed to have been. I'm not living for the Lord. I don't have a relationship. And if I die today, if I die today, I don't know where I'm going. If that's you, pretend like you're not saved and get saved today. Don't leave doubting. Not when you have the opportunity. So we have the, the celebration crowd. We have the confirmation crowd. We have the dedication crowd. There are some people here this morning that have never ever accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior and you need to do so today. You need to dedicate your life to the Lord. You need to make that decision. 
perhaps this sermon this day was built exactly because it's exactly what God wanted you to hear. And it would break my heart and it would break every person's heart in here that's a believer to know that someone walked out of those doors and had never accepted Christ as their Lord and as their Savior when He died for you. When He died for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Sister family, you get ready. Maybe you are here this morning and you're celebrating, praise God, celebrate the risen Savior. Maybe you're here this morning and you need confirmation and, and I want you just to come up. Let's have a prayer together and let's make sure that you are saved before you leave today. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you need to dedicate your life to the Lord. You've never been saved. You aren't sure. You don't know. And, and there's something that has been said, sung, or done has, has struck a chord in your heart today. You want to be sure before you leave. You come, whenever she starts to play, you come and let's pray together and let's make sure that you are what your sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That opportunity is for you this morning. Maybe you're here today and, and you just don't know and you just want to me to lead you in that. Here's what I want you to do. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I want you to say, I want you to pray, I want you to pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I know you are the Christ. I know you died for me. I know that if I call upon your name, you will forgive me. I want to be saved. And if you pray that prayer, you let me know before you leave, okay? Everybody stand your feet. Please keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. Now stand please. If you want to come forward this morning and make sure of your salvation, please do so. Please don't hesitate to come as you please.